that's the theme from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight, a story of the West with Lorne Green as your host. Here's a preview. You have heard of the Confederacy which has been formed among some of the southern states. Yes. There's also a movement here in California to pull our state out of the Union, form a Pacific Republic, and lend our assistance to the southern effort. Your father and I are both part of this movement. I can tell you no more. The Sears Radio Theater will begin after this message from your local station. This is Lorne Green. During the months preceding that fateful dawn of April 12, 1861, when the southern guns opened fire on Fort Sumter, a little-known contest of loyalties was being waged in our westernmost state, California. The discovery of gold in 49 had lured people from all over the world and from every part of the Union. California became a state in 1850. The quiet village of Yerba Buena grew into the reckless and prosperous city of San Francisco, and millions of dollars worth of gold poured into the federal treasury every month. It was this fabulous outpouring of mineral wealth which made California the target of secessionists in the early months of 1861. Their plan? To divert the flow of gold to the coppers of the newly formed Southern Confederacy. Now let me say again that we will no longer be controlled by an Eastern government thousands of miles away in Washington. From now on, we must think of ourselves as citizens of the Pacific Republic, and once we overrun the federal garrison at the Presidio, we'll be free to assist our friends in the Confederacy with the gold bullion that's all in need. Right. All right. Now set yourselves up for one more round, men, then it's time to leave. Now, uh, if the wrong people see you on the street at this hour of the night, they're liable to think that you're a secessionist. <laughs> I have a special job for you, Mr. Kingston. Yes, sir. You're being in the shipping business and handling so much cargo between here in Charleston and New Orleans qualifies you for this assignment. And uh, what assignment is that, Mr. Kingston? Uh, be a man in front of your shipping office tomorrow morning. You had to meet this man and accompany him on foot to a safe house I've chosen for him. The address is on this card. Yeah. Uh, nobody to know his name or that he's in town. Just prepare to him only as colonel. Your presence with a stranger will rouse less suspicion than if I were to meet him. My politics are too well known. Uh, what does this have to do with storming the Presidio? Well, I'll explain that to you tomorrow. But remember this, Mr. Kingston. The South is counting on the success of our mission. Your property, your business, even your life will depend upon obeying my orders. And that's only the beginning of our story. Sears Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week. Brought to you in Elliot Lewis production of the Sears Radio Theater. Our story, Conspiracy at the Golden Gate, by Chris Fortunato. Our stars, Lynn Berman, Dawes Butler, and Ben Wright. The Sears Radio Theater is brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company. Sears, where America shops for value. diary of the young merchant Toby Kingston that guides us through the inner workings of the plot to wrest California from the Union. It gives us the rare opportunity to hear how one conspirator dealt with the various responsibilities which tugged at his conscience at this little known but crucial moment in the history of our country. Wednesday, 7 a.m. My loyalties are with my business associates in the South and with my family in Virginia. I wonder if Hastings really means I will die if I don't follow his orders. Well, I'll meet this man called the Colonel down at the docks this morning and find out what all this is about. You wouldn't be waiting for someone, would you? 
Maybe I am, and uh, maybe I'm not. My name's Kingston, Toby Kingston. And who do you think I am? The Colonel. <laughs> well, you're right about that. I've been waiting here pretty near an hour. My rump is sore and my throat is so dry I can hardly talk. <laughs> Come on, take your bag. We've got to get you up to the safe house. Then we can get you some food and drink. Mm, you're talking my language. Well, it sure is building up this time. You've been here before, Colonel. Eleven years ago. I had gold fever, just like the rest of them. <laughs> and I ain't no colonel, by the way. My name uh, is uh, Hiram Jasper. Listen here, I'm not supposed to know your name. Nor is anyone else in this town. And I don't care if you're a colonel or a jackrabbit. I'm calling you colonel because <laughs> those are my instructions. <laughs> vaguely recalled something about a couple of brothers named Jaspers who had worked a mine together up in Nevada City and the few they were supposed to have had over a woman. Hold on a minute. Hold on, hold on. I, I got a mind to see what this meeting's all about. You can't stop here, Colonel. I'm not supposed to let you be noticed. Now, who's going to notice me? They're all looking at that minister fellow up there on the platform. Excuse me there, man. Colonel, no. I have my instructions from Hastings. There ought to be no stops along the way. Now, come on. This is no place for us. Can't go running into every crowd you see, Colonel. There are spies everywhere. <laughs> now, stay nice and quiet. Toby? Hey, Toby Kingston, wait a minute. Well, I haven't seen you in centuries. <laughs> Well, where have you been keeping yourself? Uh, I never see you at the Bell Union anymore. I've got too much work. Big shipment of hides and flour going out. Uh, look, Bill, I don't have much time right now. Oh, I, I understand. But I, I just saw you go past the miners' hall, and uh, why don't you and uh, and your friend here uh, come in with me and listen to Reverend Star King? Uh, oh, he's a brilliant orator, that man. He almost makes you believe he can hold the Union together with the force of his will. You know, I used to hear him speak in Boston. I'm in a mean hurry, Bill. Oh, well, well, the least you can do is listen to what I found out this morning. I had breakfast with Reverend King, and he told me that General Albert Sidney Johnston is being removed from command at the federal garrison at the Presidio. His replacement is expected to arrive this weekend, and the government thinks that General Johnston, being a Texan, might have the wrong sympathies. Hey, this is a big story, Toby. None of the other reporters have this information yet. Oh, good, good. Well, we'll talk about it some night soon. I'll have to get along now. Oh, well, sure, Toby. I, I didn't mean to interfere with your business. Friend of yours, huh? Yeah, he's a good friend, but I don't like the idea that he saw you. He works for a newspaper. He's a thinking man. Went to Harvard back in Massachusetts. I don't reckon I've ever been to Harvard. He came out here, worked a claim for a month, and then came to me asking for a job. Said he wanted to... Right about all that was going on out of here in California. Uh -huh. To get a job at a newspaper. By the way, uh, don't let Hastings know he saw us. <laughs> don't you worry about me. I hope I don't have to, because if we make a misstep, everything is lost. street corner, and as I guided the colonel to the safe house on a quiet back street off Portsmouth Square, I felt the tension of an impending explosion all around me. I trust you gentlemen had no trouble getting here from the wars. Not at all, Ned. You walked, of course. That's right. Good. People in this neighborhood are less likely to take notice if you're on foot. Well, sit down, gentlemen. Bourbon? All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nicest thing anybody said to me all day. Uh-huh. Here you are, gentlemen. We don't drink out of the bottle in this town anymore, Colonel. Now, you don't have to do none of that Colonel business in here, Ned. This fellow knows my name now. He told you his name, Kingston? Uh, yes. Well, I trust you'll keep it to yourself. Oh, of course I will. And don't worry about me none, neither. I am not stirring from this here house just as you ordered in your letter. Well, now, as far as calling you Colonel is concerned, we have to do it all the time so we get used to it. Anyone learns your name, friend or foe, it'll get around town and then into the newspapers. 
and stir up trouble with your brother again. Now, we can't take that kind of chance. I need you to oversee delivery of our first shipment of gold to New Orleans. You know the mines and how to transport the gold. You're the only man I can trust to do this properly. Well, you are right about that. Do you mind if I have a refill? One shot, Colonel. All right, that's enough, Colonel. We have business to discuss. Do you know, Ned, that uh, General Johnson's being relieved of his duties this weekend? His replacement's on the way. Now, wherever did you pick up such a rumor? I thought you came straight to the house from the wall. We did, but we uh, overheard some men talking on a street corner. Is that what happened, Colonel? Why, sure. Oh, yeah. uh, three or four men were talking about the government replacing General Johnston this weekend because he's a southerner. Isn't that right, Colonel? Uh-huh, sure. Um, three or four of them. Did you recognize any of these men, Kingston? No. They were all strangers to me. Well, and this is a warning to us that we have to move quickly while the sympathizer is still in command. Now, Colonel... I want you to lead an attack on the Mint Friday night. We'll take every ounce of gold from there and ship it to Jefferson Davis. In the meantime, Colonel, I don't want you to take one step outside of this house. Now, don't you worry about me. I'll just uh, make myself comfortable. Kingston, you'll be at my place Thursday night at 10 for meeting. Between now and then, you're to relay my instructions to the Colonel. And you make sure he stays put. He had a feud with his brother some years back, got himself shanghaied. He wanted for murder. And we don't want him seen by anybody. Do you understand? Of course, Mr. Hastings. That same evening, I sat down to a solitary dinner at the International Hotel where I live, but it was not long before my friend Sweeter joined me. You know, Toby, when I saw you this morning, you were trying to prevent me from meeting that man who was with you. It seemed to me you were hiding something. What are you getting at? You're mixed up in this secession movement, aren't you? You just better stop following me around. Toby, breaking California away from the Union is an idle dream. California is part of a whole, not an island out here in the Pacific Ocean. The lifeblood of our nation is flowing westward to California. Thousands of people every month. They're Americans. And they aren't coming out here to make this a foreign country. <laughs> Sounds like one of those editorials your editor writes. I write them. All he does is sign his name to them. Listen to me, Bill. I don't ever want to see my name in that paper of yours. necessary to keep my reporter friend off the scent at least until Friday but I soon discovered that I had more than just him to worry about when I visited the colonel the next day Wednesday I need you to uh, do a favor for me what kind of favor now perhaps you don't know about this but uh, I got a daughter living in this town I haven't seen her for around 11 years I thought I'd be around longer and get to know her again but uh, I'm supposed to Stay indoors like some sort of caged animal, so I need you to deliver this envelope to her. And I wrote the address down. All you have to do is see that she gets it in person. Sorry, Colonel, I can't do that. Oh, nobody's supposed to know you're here. You heard what Hastings said. Who is going to know that I'm here? Just tell my daughter that I'm far away. The answer is no. If Hastings found out about this, he'd kill me. If Hastings found out about this reporter friend of yours seeing us yesterday... He'd kill you for that, too. Chew on that for a while. Give me the letter. Here. Now, don't go throwing it in the fireplace, because if it don't get to my daughter, I am going to know about it. Emily Jaspers lived with her Uncle Wilfred in the vicinity of the old mission, Dolores. I delivered the envelope to her and retreated quickly. If I thought that was the only time I would see Miss Jaspers, I was to discover how mistaken I was that evening. She arrived at my hotel. I'm sorry to bother you, Mr. Kingston, coming up to your room like now, this. how did you find me, and how do you know my name? I asked one of the coachmen who saw you. He said you lived here at the International. <sighs> then I described you to the man at the desk, and he told me your name. There's nothing I can do to help you, Miss Jaspers. As you can see, there's a mountain of paperwork on my desk. I had to ask you about my father. He's here in San Francisco, isn't he? <sighs> yes, he is. Please, take me to see him. No, 
Absolutely not. Now, you must go home now. The longer you stay here, the more danger there is for both your father and for yourself. I can't go home. Why not? Because I left my uncle a note saying that I would never return to his house again. Oh? You see, he's been telling me all these years that my father died in a mining accident. So I thought, if you're a friend of my father's, maybe I could trust you. And, and you would help me. My valise is downstairs at the desk. With every passing hour, every passing minute, the conspiracy to wrest California from the Union was hurtling to its ultimate confrontation with the Union garrison. Wednesday evening, only two days after undertaking his duties with the conspiracy, Toby Kingston discovered that the responsibilities and dangers were far more than he'd bargained for. The young Miss Jaspers has the charm of a heroine in a novel. After I escorted her to Brown's Hotel, I fear that she drew for me more than I should have said. For the next few days, you must remain indoors. You understand that, Miss Jaspers? Please, call me Emily. We can be friends, can't we? I have no one else to rely upon. Well, you might as well call me Toby. And now, perhaps you can explain to me why your uncle has told you your father was dead. According to Uncle Wilfred, they were working in a mine up in Nevada City one day. And just a few minutes after my mother came in with a lunch pail, the mine collapsed on top of them. Uncle Wilfred said he was lucky to get out himself. People whispered at the time that there had been a, a love feud, that my uncle was luring my mother away from my father. I once overheard someone suggest that my father had actually shot my mother when he found her in the arms of Uncle Wilfred. But I never questioned Uncle Wilfred's story. I wanted to believe it. It made everything so uncomplicated and natural. Hmm. And was there actually a cave? Oh, yes. The mine has been closed till this day. Your story helps explain why we can't let your father's presence in San Francisco be known. Can't you tell me what business you and my father are involved in? If I knew, it would help me be more patient. Please, Toby. If I tell you, you must promise that you won't breathe a word of it to anyone. For if you do, I hate to imagine what would happen to your father and me. I promise I wouldn't do anything to endanger you. Hmm. You have heard of the Confederacy which has been formed among some of the southern states. Yes. There's also a movement here in California to pull our state out of the Union, form a Pacific Republic, and lend our assistance to the southern effort. Your father and I are both part of this movement. I can tell you no more. Thursday morning. I attended to a few things down at the shipping office, the most important of which was securing a dozen small boats for the following night. That done, I went to the safe house. Colonel, I brought you a newspaper. Thought you might be bored playing cards all day. I'm bored staying cooped up in this house. Did you see my daughter? I did. Good. Tell me something, Kingston. Uh, what my daughter look like? Prettier than you, Colonel. <laughs> I should hope so. Now, oh, by the way, I received a message from Hastings at my office a short while ago. He wants you to be sober and ready for action tomorrow night. He'll be in to see you and make final plans tomorrow afternoon. In the meantime, I'll have to take away this bottle of bourbon. Yeah, you might as well. I don't have any other liberties to speak of. Hey, you didn't tell me nothing about my daughter running away. What? What are you talking about, Colonel? Look, right here on the paper. The young woman runs away with she missing since yesterday afternoon. She was a reward posted for a safe return for Emily Jass. Her safe return, my foot, was that brother of mine had kidnapped her. He must have found out about that envelope. Nobody saw me hand over that envelope, Colonel. And besides, the newspaper doesn't say anything about your brother kidnapping her. You don't have to say. I know. Why would he kidnap her, then post reward for a return? The reward's just a bluff. He probably knows I'm back in town. He's using my daughter as a hostage, so I won't come after him. Maybe it's time you tell me why you and your brother don't get along, Colonel. We worked a mine together back in 50. And uh, one day, we got in a fight over my wife. There was uh, three of us in the mine at the time. 
Wilfred fell back uh, against one of the support beams, and part of the mine caved in. Well, it killed my wife, Mabel, and it broke both my legs. Wilfred dragged me out of there and shipped me off. Hastings told me that brother of mine got everybody thinking that I killed my wife. He wanted to make it hard for me to come back. But right now, I don't care who sees me. He is not going to kidnap my daughter. You can't go anywhere until Friday night, Colonel. Hastings is counting on you to transport that gold. You can't get wrapped up in something else. Get out of my way, Kingston. I waited too long for this. Do you think I come up here just to help Hastings in, in, in this harebrained idea? Where yeah. exactly are you going to look, Colonel? Are you going to knock on every door up and down the street asking for Emily Jaspers? Don't you realize that the moment you walk out that door, you have no friends? The newspapers will be on to you in an hour, digging into your past. And if your brother doesn't get a hold of you and give you a one-way ticket to the bottom of the Pacific, Hastings will. I won't be there to shed any tears for you, Colonel, because Hastings will be coming after me when he finishes with you. It's times like this that I wished I had a fortune teller advise me what to do. There was a woman up in Nevada City some of the men used to talk about. They, they say that, that she could read the thoughts right out of your head. Amy had just the right and proper way. Uh, they called her Madame Selinsky. Madame Selinsky? Why, I know her. Oh, she's pretty much retired now, though. Retired or not, we're going to see her. The only way I'm taking that gold to New Orleans is if I take my daughter, too. Ned Hastings doesn't have to know. Now, come on. You show me the way. Now, now, hold on there, Colonel. I can't have you taking any unnecessary trips outdoors. First, let me go see if Madam Selinsky will give you a reading. We can't go barging into her home uninvited. All right, Kingston. But you be quick about it. Or I ain't staying here much longer. <laughs> Help me, Madam Selinsky. You must tell this man that his daughter will find him at the wharves tomorrow night and that you see them boarding a schooner together. The daughter's name is Emily. She's a beautiful young woman and she wants very much to see her father. If I bring them together now, it will ruin the business deal. And it's my responsibility to see that the colonel does his job. My life depends on it. You must help me, Madam Selinsky. Name your prize. <sighs> This is a most unusual thing you ask me to do, Mr. Kingston. I... I will accept no less than $500. It's a deal. <laughs> you won't regret this, Madam Slinsky. I hope that you won't regret it either. When that was done, I raced back to the safe house to fetch the colonel. Less than a half hour later, we were seated in Madame Selinsky's parlor. As I look into my crystal ball, I see a young lady in a room. It's a nice room, perhaps in a house or a hotel. She uh, has uh, blonde hair, very sensitive features. Her name is Emily. Is it not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's her. <laughs> hey, uh, let me have a look in that thing. Oh, Cardinal, sit down. There is more. Your daughter is looking for you, and... Wait. I see her finding you. Yes, she will find you, and you will be together with her once again, Cardinal. <laughs> well, she don't have long to find me. I'm, <laughs> I'm shipping out of here tomorrow night. Have faith in the inevitable. You must have faith. Because what I see is the inevitable. <gasps> Wait a moment. What do I see here? That was a good reading, Madam Slinsky. I think the colonel was satisfied. It's time for us to be hey, getting back. Quiet. Oh, all right, all right. <laughs> Some bird you got there, <laughs> Madam Slinsky. Listen to what I have to say. I see gold here. Gold? And yet I see it as the bane of your existence. Gold is the bane of your existence. You must remember that, Colonel. We have to hurry back. I hope Hastings isn't waiting there for us. Now, what she mean when she said, uh, uh, gold is the bane of my existence? Oh, she means, uh, you like it and, uh, it likes you. Oh, yeah. You'll be seeing plenty of it tomorrow night when you bash down the doors and win. 
When I went to the meeting that evening, I considered the happy thought that in 24 hours, the mint would be emptied and the attack upon the Presidio would be over, for better or worse. And my responsibility of the conspiracy would be done. Little did I know how slowly those 24 hours would pass. Well, is that clear, gentlemen? Eight o'clock tomorrow night. Do you all know your assigned position? How many men each are to bring along? Now then, Kingston, I have a little task for you. You are to reserve a private dining room at your hotel for tomorrow night. Schedule your dinner for 8 o'clock and invite General Johnson to be your guest, along with 8 or 10 other gentlemen of moderate political opinion. We want the general to be out of the way. Do uh, you think you can manage that? No trouble at all. Uh, and by the way, there's uh, no need for you to visit the colonel anymore. Uh, much too dangerous for anyone to be seen going in and out of the safe house tomorrow. So oh, just to make sure, see if those boats are tied up at your wharf so the colonel and his party can make a fast getaway with the gold. That's all been taken care of. All right, gentlemen. Now, you can rest assured that General Johnston has made no effort to strengthen the defense of the Presidio. My spies tell me that he would welcome any move to displace the federal authority while his back is turned. Now then, gentlemen, we have one more problem to clear up. It's that reporter who's been following many of us around. Sweeter, his name is. And I think tomorrow won't be too soon to do to him what we do to all folks who snoop around where they don't belong. Why didn't he stay out of this? Tomorrow night, the gates of the Presidio will be open to us. In the state of California, and all its gold will be ours. Now, anyone who interferes or betrays my trust will be shot. We've got to rule the sweeter. Concluding act of conspiracy at the Golden Gate. All that night, I worried about the threat Hastings had made on Sweeter's life. I knew I had to warn my friend, for his life was certainly worth more than a shipment of gold to Jefferson Davis. Early Friday morning, I went to visit Sweeter at his boarding house below Rincon Hill. Come in. Ah, it's you, Toby. It's a good thing I found you. Well, what's the matter? Listen to me, Bill. Your life is in danger. Ned Hastings is out to kill you. You've got to stay out of the way. He means business. So you're admitting that you were mixed up in the secession business? Of course I'm admitting it. You must know everything already. Otherwise, Hastings wouldn't be out to get you. Hmm. It's good of you to let me know, Toby. How deeply are you involved with him? I'm supposed to host a dinner for General Johnston tonight while Hastings attacks the Presidio. Oh. I've also been hiding Emily's father, the colonel. He'll be storming the mint at the same time Hastings attacks the Presidio. And Emily Jaspers? What are you going to do about her? You've seen her. I, I followed both of you to Brown's Hotel Wednesday evening. <sighs> I'm going to see that she and her father are united. Tonight. Toby, don't you realize what you've done? By trying to save my life and aid Emily Jaspers, you're betraying the secessionists. And if Hastings ever finds out, he'll go after you as well as me. Transporting that gold means everything to him. The South can't support its confederacy without that gold. I don't care about the gold. Oh, at first I felt obligated to help Hastings. After all, most of the secessionists are business associates, and most of my shipping is to southern ports. But I didn't expect the price to be this high. What good is it to me to transport gold to Jefferson Davis if you're dead? Or if Emily Jaspers has to go another 11 years or perhaps the rest of her life without seeing her father? Yeah, but you must have that dinner tonight, Toby. As long as you play your part, Hastings will show his cards, and we can have done with the secession movement once and for all. In the meantime, I've got to warn the colonel. Warn the colonel? What do you mean? Well, I too promised Emily I'd find her father. If he goes on this mission tonight, he may not come out of it alive. If you go near that safe house, you may not come out of it alive. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get there through the alleyway. It's safer. And besides, you're risking your life for me. I'll risk my life for Emily and for the Union. All right. I'll book them passage to New Orleans. There's a ship leaving tonight. Mm -hmm. But when Hastings sees that the colonel has disappeared, he's apt to suspect something. He won't know anything's wrong until it's too late. 
I'll tell the colonel to wait until early evening and then slip down to your office where Emily will be waiting for him. As long as you have that dinner for General Johnston and the colonel sits tight until this evening, everything will be all right. It's going to be dangerous going near that house, Bill. I want I want you to take this with you. Here. A derringer? You might need it. Go on, take it. Oh, no, I couldn't do that. Toby, I came out to California to write stories, not to shoot people. And if I did find that derringer, I'd probably kill the wrong person. Be careful, friend. If Hastings sees you, you're finished. Friday afternoon, my friend Bill Sweeter went to visit the colonel. I didn't know until later what difficulties he encountered. Colonel! Colonel! Who's there? What are you doing out there? What do you want? Open the door and let me in. I've got some news about your daughter. Emily. Yeah, now open the door. I can't stand out here forever. Come on in. Oh, thank you. Well, what do you know about Emily? Well, she'll be down at Kingston's Wharf tonight at 8. If you meet her there, you can sail to New Orleans tonight. Kingston will book your passage. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you know where Emily is, take me to her. No, I, I can't do that. If you want to see Emily, you'll wait here until 7.30. But you can't go on that raid tonight. The federal troops are at the Mint and are armed to the teeth. You'll never get out alive. If you leave here now, Hastings will find out and come after you. But if you wait until 7.30, it'll be too late for him to do anything. I'm not waiting any longer. I'm tired of being cooped up in here with everybody telling me what to do. They even took away my bourbon. Oh, Colonel, you've got to stay here until 7.30. We can't let Hastings find out about this. I smell a trap, mister, and I don't like it. What? You're trying to get me locked up because I'm mixed up with those ribs. Yeah. Now, you tell me where my daughter Emily is, or I'm going to pound you through the floor. You let go of me. Where is she? I won't tell you. Somebody's at the front door. There's probably Hastings. I'm getting out the back way. Hey. Colonel. It is Hastings. Colonel, is that you? I'd better get out of here, too. Colonel, where are you? Johnston? Yes, I don't mind if I do. Yeah, this is a fine little gathering, Mr. Kingston. It will make my memory of San Francisco a little fonder. When I heard the gunfire, I knew the attack on the Presidio had begun. A few minutes later, a note was brought in to General Johnston by the head waiter. I held my breath while he read it. Finally, he rose from his chair. Gentlemen, I am sorry to interrupt you, but may I have your attention? I have just received a message informing me that a small band of men has attacked the Presidio. Now, there is no cause for alarm. They were repulsed quite easily, and my soldiers are in pursuit. Many people during the past few weeks have questioned my loyalty to the Union. Let me state now that as long as I wear the uniform of a United States general, I will be loyal to that uniform. You must all excuse me. It has been a very pleasant dinner. Uh, Mr. Kingston, hmm. would you care to step outside with me? I'd be happy to, General. I am indebted to you and your friend, Mr. Sweeter. If he hadn't told me about this attack, I might not have been as well prepared as I was. I wasn't expecting Hastings to make trouble for another week or two. Hastings wanted to attack before you were relieved because he thought you were sympathetic to the Southern cause. Many people believe that. But there are loyalties, Mr. Kingston, that go beyond all politics. My loyalty is to my uniform. But what it represents. Good night to you. I must go now. Good luck to you, General. I was not sorry to see my dinner party disperse soon after the departure of General Johnston, for my thoughts were with my friend Bill Sweeter and with Emily Jaspers, who was depending on us. I hope they were safe. This is Toby's office. Come on inside. Where do you think my father is? Oh, he knows you'll be here, so I'll count on him showing up sooner or later. 
When Toby arrives, he'll probably have some information about your father. Uh, let me see if I can find a candle. There's one on that table by the window. Oh, good. I'll close the shutters first, then we can light it. Ah, there, that's better. All right, get a move on. You pay. Someone's in the hallway. Keep moving, Taylor. It sounds like two people. Yeah, I, I, I know. What are we going to do? Well, what can we do? Well, looks like we have some guests. Step into the room, Colonel. Come on. Uh, well, what's your business here, Hastings? Well, now, why don't you light a few more candles, Mr. Sweeter, and everything will be explained. Young? Father. Is it you? Oh. Oh, Emily. We're going to be together now, Emily. Father, why is this man pointing a pistol at you? I'll answer that, miss. I'm pointing a pistol at your father because he betrayed the Confederacy. Now, uh, you enjoy your reunion while you can because he's about to take a long voyage. Nobody's going to Shanghai me again. Well, that's what you think. Every ounce of gold you lost for the Confederacy, you'll pay in sweat. That will be too good for you. I'm going to make you suffer. And as for you, Mr. Sweeter, you'd be prepared for hard work. You won't need those nice clothes of yours where you're going. Once your friend Kingston arrives, we'll be on our way. I knew nothing of this, of course. I took a carriage through the city to my office, through streets filled with people milling about with looks of fear and dismay on their faces. I arrived at my office by the waterfront, and had just stepped into the hallway when... Kingston? That you? Toby, he has a pistol. Watch out! You keep your mouth shut. Now leave those candles alone. Phil, are you all right? Yeah. Don't, don't worry. He, he missed me. I got him. He ain't shooting anybody now. He shot Paul. Good work, Colonel. I'll get a rope and tie him up. We'll leave him here for General Johnston to take care of. Father, are you all right? Of course I am. Let's have some light in here so we can see what we're doing. Uh, I'll light the candles. Colonel, we have to hurry. I booked passage for you and Emily on the Manhasset Star. She's sailing tonight for New Orleans. She's anchored out in the bay. You can row out to her in one of my boats. I'm much obliged to you. And you too, Mr. Sweeter. I guess I should have stayed in that safe house this afternoon. You've risked so much to help us. I'll always be grateful to both of you gentlemen for helping me find my father. You hear that, Toby? You weren't a secessionist. You're a unionist. You united a father and a daughter. <laughs> Sweeter and I stood on the shore and watched the colonel and his daughter Emily roll away into the darkness. As their silhouette faded from sight, I thought of the pain of their separation and the joy of their reunion. It made me realize how painful it would have been for California to be torn away from the union and how just it is that she remains our westernmost state. Yes, my friend Sweeter is right. I am a unionist after all. And brought to you by Sears Roebuck and Company, where our policy is satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Sears, where America shops for value. Conspiracy at the Golden Gate was written by Chris Fortunato, produced and directed by Fletcher Markle. Your host was Lorne Green. Our stars were Len Berman, Dawes Butler, and Ben Wright. Also heard were Lou Horn, Ann Given, Lillian Baev, and Marvin Miller. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. Art Gilmore speaking. The Elliott Lewis production of Sears Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI.